Um, yeah, actually, so uh, everyone else afterwards, after Barclay, who's an idealist, says, but of course, I'm not that bad kind of Barclay an idealist. <laughs> so they were learning about the, you know, what was, what was that bad type of idealism um, that they didn't want to be identified with? So, um, okay, so basically, I mean, I don't know if I ever talk about this systematically in this course, although we've seen it a lot in Locke, the distinction between subsets and accidents or modes. Um, um, right, so a substance. Is something that can exist on its own. It um, is the ultimate subject of predication. It's the thing that remains constant while other things change, while its, while its properties change. Um, and then, like accidents are, or modes are the opposite. They're things that can't exist on their own, but only in a sub. They express something that can be predicated of a substance, um, and they can change while the substance remains the same. This, right, this is an Aristotelian uh, um, this, this is a fundamental feature of Aristotelian metaphysics, which most of the early modern philosophers continue in one way or another. Um, so Barclay, um, Barclay's basic thought is, first of all, an idea is something which can't exist on its own. It can't be conceived to exist on its own. Rather, its mode of being is to exist in a mind. So this tells you that ideas are modes of a substance. They're not substances themselves. And moreover, um, so they, this is the substance of the mind. Here. Accidents or mode is the idea, or the ideas are accidents or modes. And um, Barclay says this is the only kind of in existence. Right? In existence is the kind of existence that accidents or modes have. They exist in the substance. This is the only this is the, this is the only kind of in existence we understand. So therefore, we can't conceive of an idea or anything like an idea, either existing on its own or in anything other than a mind. Right, we can't conceive an idea existing on its own or in anything other than a mind because, oh, sorry, we can't exist of it, conceive of an idea existing on its own because ideas are accidents or modes that aren't conceivable on their own. I'm not giving an argument for this yet, right? I'm just saying, just summarizing like what the world is like according to Barclay, basically. <laughs> so, um, um, we can't conceive of them existing on their own. We can't conceive of them existing in anything other than mind, because again, this is the only kind of an existence that we understand, the existence of an idea in a mind. 
and anything that is like an idea um, would also have to be an accident or mode rather than a substance. Again, I'm not really explaining why that's the case. Yeah, that's going to be an important question, right? But anything that is resembles an idea will also have to be an accident or mode. So it couldn't exist on its own. And again, this is the only kind of inexistence we understand. So it has to exist in a mind. So um, um, this means that um, if uh, I have an idea, what Locke would call the idea of a snowball, well, this is the idea of a snowball. The idea of a snowball is something that can only exist in a mind. And anything it resembles can only exist. So, so it neither is nor in any way resembles anything that it could, could exist on its own or in some other alleged kind of substance like a body. Um, So it's really wrong to call it an idea of a snowball. Um, it is the snowball. <laughs> yes. So is the word in existence being used like within existence, or is it not like something that doesn't exist? Or... No, it's existing in. Okay, so it's not like in existence, like lack of existence. Yeah, another word for this is I'm using this because I, I think Barclay uses that word sometimes, but another word for this is inheritance. Okay. Um, in other words, for that supposed relationship between uh, an accident and the substance that is in, that supports it, right? Or I think I, did I talk, I think I talked about this at some point when I talked about Locke, maybe, that substance, in Latin, you know, this means, seems to me that it stands under um, and I think I said that that actually it comes from a Latin translation of a Greek word that doesn't mean that at all. But a lot of people, are, you know, do things with that Latin etymology. So support is also really like support is like uh, get under and carry. Um, um, so there are only ideas and spirits, but there are no bodies. Or anyway, if there are, our ideas don't resemble them in any way. So they're irrelevant. Um, and moreover, when you say their bodies, like um, a body is supposed to be an extended substance, but here's the idea of extension. The idea of extension doesn't resemble anything except an idea that exists in a mind. So if there's some other kind of substance that's not a mind, um, whatever characteristics it has, um, extension is not one of them, right? Because our idea of extension doesn't resemble any um, characteristic that this other substance has in any way. So really it's wrong to call it a body, right? So in other words, you can say, well, there could be unknown substances of unknown properties that have no, that we have no idea of. And then Barclay says, well, um, 
I mean, first of all, he doesn't really think that makes sense that we even understand what we're talking about when he says that, but he also says, you know, unknown supports of unknown qualities have nothing to do with us. <laughs> so, you know, believe in them if you want. <laughs> right? you're, 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 you know, for our point of view, they're not. Right. So all there are are ideas and a spirit. So this isn't the idea of a snowball. This, or at least, um, when I'm sensing the snowball, I'm not having an idea of a snowball. What I'm sensing is the snowball. So, right, like remember Locke's picture, here's the operation of sensation in mind. This is the operation of sensation. Locke says its immediate object is an idea. But somehow, by way of this idea, it has immediate object that's a body. And the body is extended. And um, of course, Locke thinks since extension is a primary quality, that our idea of extension does resemble something in the external object. Um, so right, that's Locke. But now, so like this is the snowball that I'm perceiving. This is like the idea of the snowball. And what I'm perceiving immediately is the idea of the snowball. And what I'm perceiving immediately, perceiving immediately is the snowball. All that is locked, but now, Where's the snowball? <laughs> this is Barkley. There's the only thing that I perceive here is an idea. So, um, if there is, so, so this is not the idea of anything else. <laughs> Um, and um, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself, again, but partly it's going to say this idea is the snowball. Right? And he's going to claim that, that he's in line with common sense because it's common sense that what I perceive is the snowball itself and not some mysterious idea that's between me and the snowball. Right? So in other words, looking at Locke's picture, Barkby is going to say, Locke is trying to convince you that when you see a snowball, you don't really see the snowball, you see an idea. And then based on that, you somehow infer that there's this other thing there, and that's the snowball. And Barclay is going to say, but that's not what you ordinary believe. Right? What you ordinary believe is that the very thing that you immediately perceive is the snowball. Barclay says, and that's what I'm telling you. <laughs> the idea of the snowball is the snowball. So, are there other questions about this so far? Yeah. Um, what does it does it does that say the idea of sensation? It says operation of sensation. Operation of sensation. Okay. Um, and that was just oh, okay. yeah. actually what does it say after it says inherence. Thank you. you might have spelled it wrong. I think that's one. I'm not very good at spelling. Blackboards don't have a spell checker built in. Unfortunately. Yeah. Is he approaching this at, like, is it an epistemological justification or metaphysical one or both? I mean, is he saying 
assuming that how people really are, just like what would you know about? Um, oh, so if you're asking, does he does he say? I mean, that's kind of kind of what I was just talking about. Does he say there might really be a snowball there, but we can't know it? So, I mean, he says that. Um, But if by a snowball you mean something that resembles this idea, then that's impossible and absurd. Right? So it's not just that you don't know that it's there, it's that it couldn't be there. Right. right. Because again, extension um, and position and all those other things that have to do with being in space and being a body are ideas that in our mind. And they don't resemble anything that's not an idea in a mind. So um so it's therefore it's a contradiction in terms. It's kind of a manifest contradiction to think that there's an extended, unthinking substance. Um, um, so um, the reason I said maybe I'm getting ahead of myself is. <coughs> That um, I kind of already given away the well part of the punchline, but that um, so what is the opposite of idealism? <laughs> so the opposite the opposite of idealism is supposed to be realism. Um, now I think before I talked about nominalism and realism. Um, it, you know, it's the same word realism, but it's it's a different contrast, right? In the case of nominalism versus realism, the contrast is between race and no man, name, right? So thing versus name, realism versus nominalism. Is there a thing there or is it only a name? <laughs> um, but when we talk about realism versus idealism, the contrast is race versus idea, right? Thing versus idea. Um, and right, so idealism, um, idealism about something is the view that it's the property of our ideas and not of things. Right, so like you could say uh, Locke is an idealist about power, but he's a realist about extension. Um, um, but like idealism in general like, um, is the view that what there are is ideas. <laughs> right, so like idealism about all properties. Um, and that, as we've just been saying, is Barclay's view, right? So, like, everything we think of as um, a quality of a body or anything else is, um, is an idea. Um, however, um, it's not exactly opposed to realism. I mean, that is, it's opposed to what someone might mean by realism. That is what someone might mean by thing. Barclay thinks there aren't any of them. <laughs> right, so if, the, if, if this is the idea, and this is the thing or race, then Barclay doesn't believe in this. Right, so he's not a realist, he's an idealist. But Barclay has an explanation, which I already read to you last time about what the word thing is. Um, so he's gonna explain why, um, even though there's nothing but ideas and spirits, um, we have a use for the word thing and there's a sense in which it's right to say that there are things. 
Um, and here's the definition of thing that he first gives. So this is in section one of part one on page 23. Right, so first he talks about various ideas that I get through various senses. By sight, I have the ideas of light and colors with their several degrees and variations. By touch, I perceive, for example, hard and soft, heat and cold, motion and resistance, smelling furnishes me with odors, etc. And then he says, and as several of these are observed to accompany each other, they come to be marked by one name and so to be reputed as one thing. And then the example he gives is not a snowball, but an apple. Thus, for example, so apple. So um, thus, for example, a certain color, taste, smell, figure, and consistence, having been observed to go together, are accounted one distinct thing signified by the name apple. Right, so a thing is, this is actually a little trickier than it might seem at first. So like, here's, here's a first pass at it. An apple is a collection of ideas that, that often come together. A certain smell, a certain taste, a certain shape, a certain color. Um, and so when I get all those ideas together, um, I call that, combination of ideas and apples. And when I say when I get them all together, well, actually, let me leave that up in the air for a moment. So when I get all these ideas together, I say that's that's an apple. Um, So, so from this point of view, a thing would be a group of ideas that, uh, that often come together and then we're given one name. That is like basically it's what Locke calls a complex idea. However, the reason I said it's a little bit trickier than that is that as a matter of fact, you don't get those ideas every time you perceive an apple. You don't get all of them, right? I mean, some of them you almost never get at the same time, right? Like, like to get the taste of the apple, you have to bite into it, and then you like you can't see its whole shape, <laughs> right? So, like, and, and, and in any case, when you put one side of the apple, you're not seeing the other side, and so, right? So, like, you don't actually get all those ideas at the same time. What, so, like, what this really means is that those ideas go together in some regular way. That one is like a one can be used as a sign. What, like, what I called before a syntactic sign of the others, right? So, when you see a certain color and a certain shape, um, you know that ordinarily, if um, you know. A certain course of events takes place, you'll taste a certain taste. So really a thing is a kind of like um, rule by which different ideas come together either at the same time or in succession. And this is gonna be important uh, I think and I'll talk about this next time we talk about what Barclay's response to skepticism is. So like if I um, when I think there's an apple, um, I'm uh, I'm really expressing a reliance on that rule. Right, that is, I'm relying on this being a case of that rule that not only the particular ideas that I'm getting right now, but certain that, that all the others would come if um, I do the right things or the right things happen. Right, because you know, otherwise, 
Like suppose I see that color and shape of an apple, and then I put my hand out. Now, of course, I put my hand out according to Barclay also means that I have certain ideas, <laughs> right? But like, never mind that complication. So I, I see that shape and, I, and that color. Now I put my hand out. And instead of stopping where the skin of the apple should be, it just goes right through. So it turns out it wasn't an apple, right? Because it had that color and shape, but not that consistency. So when I saw, when I when I like saw the apple, what I was doing is noting some ideas and relying on those as a sign of other ideas. Yeah. I saw like. If I like didn't put an apple with my eyes closed, have my eyes and how green, like in all in all other aspects would be like just like an apple, it would be different color. When I call it like a green apple or I call it brown apple, but like where the necessary quality of green apple or the variation. I mean, so first of all, in real life apples, a lot of apples are green, but like yeah, let's forget about that. Right. So <laughs> imagine that we only call red things apple. Well, so I mean. Um, like this is something that the Locke discussed a lot, right? Like, you know, um, what tells us whether where the boundary of one species is, like what's a big enough difference to make it a different species? Um, and Locke said, well, like it depends what we're willing to give our name to, give the name to. And I think that's the same thing Barclay is saying here, right? He says, uh, thus, for example, a certain color, taste, smell, figure, and consistence having been observed to go together are accounted one distinct thing signified by the name apple, right? So when I gave the name apple, at least ideally what I should have done is um, um, determined to follow a certain rule with when I will give that name and when I won't. And that, like, to some extent, that determination may, is arbitrary. Although, I mean, depending on my purpose, one way might be better than another. Um, so, and I mean, look, I mean, at least to some extent, this is the real situation with apples, right? Like, if someone, you know, brings you a purple apple that tastes like a lemon. You know, so like depending on how you like for what purpose you're considering this, you might say different things, right? Like if you're a botanist or something, you know, you might say, well, that's an apple. You know, um, if you're like a biochemist, then, you know, like if you, you determine that it's DNA is apple DNA, right? You might say that's an apple. But on the other hand, like if you're going to sell it in your store, you might want to call it something else because it's not what people expect, you know, people for the purpose of eating don't want something that tastes like a lemon, right? So, I mean, yeah. So, I mean, I, I think, I think that's the way Barkey would respond to questions like that. Um, what counts as one thing is, you know, it's relative to what rule I'm going to connect to which of my own signs. Um, and ultimately, the reason I want to connect things to signs is, you know, because there's things I want. <laughs> and I want to get those things by using those signs, for example. Um, right. So, um, so, like, so that's one answer to what a thing is. A thing is like a group of ideas that um, I you that often go together according to a certain rule, succeed each other, or come simultaneously according to a certain rule, um, and that I have determined to like use one name to exchange one sign for whatever ideas follow that rule. Um, but, um, you know, so like so far, though, this doesn't distinguish between uh, 
real apple and an imaginary apple. Right? So this, like, because if I imagine an apple, I also get some of those ideas in those common, you know, in those combinations, right? I imagine seeing it, I imagine seeing the shape and color, then maybe I imagine tasting it. So I imagine it tasting like an apple. Um, so like, I think in, in one sense of thing, and that's what Barclay is getting at in this first section, he wants to call that a thing too, like it's an imaginary thing, right? But in another sense of thing, where, where a thing means that it's real, right? Because I, like, as I can't emphasize enough, this, this word comes from this word, right? So, you know, so where a thing is supposed to mean that it's real, Barclay has to make a um, further qualification to the definition to distinguish between real things, that is thing things, <laughs> and imaginary things, or you might say ideal things. So like, in this sense, he actually makes a distinction between things and ideas more properly speaking as ideas in a narrow sense. So they're, they're, they're both kinds of ideas, but they're different kinds of ideas. Um, this, this terminology is, is confusing, but the point I think is pretty simple. So let me say what the, how he tries to get at this. So basically, you know, so we're basically trying to, to distinguish between sensations and um, um, we have to say we're very we're trying to distinguish between sensation and imagination. Yeah. Um so I'm just trying to understand this. I'm a little bit confused, but yeah, does would one way of saying it be Berkeley understand or Barclay understands it as like he sees a substance as two different things, and those two things are I'm just trying to compare Locke and and Barclay, but those two things would be a like a real thing and an imaginary thing. Well, like, ideas are not substance. Remember, the substance, we're not talking about that for now. I mean, Barclay does talk about that in the second section here, right? Section two of part one. But besides all that endless variety of ideas or objects of knowledge, there was likewise something which knows or perceives them and exercises diverse operations as willing, imagining, remembering about them. This perceiving active being is what I call mind, spirit, soul, or myself. That's the substance, right? So the substance is mind, spirit, soul, myself. These um, ideas of whatever kind are accidents or modes of a substance. They're modes of a thinking substance. That's what they call them. And um, so like, when Barclay, when, so when Barclay first asked, if everything is ideas, why do we use the word thing for? Right? His answer was, well, we use the word thing for not like individual ideas, let's say individual simple ideas, right? We use it for these like ways, these rules for how ideas can go normally go together. Right? So like, uh, um, that's why we think an apple is a thing, but red is not a thing. Right? Like you're, you're giving an example of a, a list of the word thing in English is really not suitable for that. <laughs> no, I mean, it really isn't. It's even though it's the right translation of race, but we just we use it in English. Or we use it as almost as a pronoun a lot of times. And it's, it's because there always has to be an explicit subject in English clause. And so if there is no subject, you have to put one in the thing. <laughs> right. So, uh, like, um, um, 
Or maybe that's another explanation. It has to be all. Well, never mind. Anyway, so the, but so like it's always it always sounds weird. But when you say something is not a thing, it sounds like you're saying it's nothing. Um, right, whereas in Latin, the word for nothing in Latin, nihil, doesn't involve the word plenty at all. But in English, you have to say it's no thing. So, right, so but anyway, I said, like, if you're thinking of things as like what we used to think of as objects of external objects of perception outside the mind right you wouldn't give red or blue as an example of that but you would give snowball or apple or whatever right so so Barclay's first answer so again the question is if the if substances are all spirits and the only other thing there are is modes of spirits and those are ideas um, and there is no thing like this what are we using the word thing for? When we, just, right, when we say there's a thing on the table or whatever, an apple is a thing. And his first answer is, well, it's not an individual simple idea, but like a complex idea. A rule for how simple ideas can go often go together and we expect them to rely on them going together. <laughs> But then I was saying, but he also wants to give another answer to what do we call a thing? And now it's to this, now he wants to distinguish between real things and imaginary things. And only a real thing is really a thing. Right. So, um, so did, did that help with the confusion? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, and so, uh, like, that really amounts to a distinction between simple ideas going together that way as sense in sensation versus in imagination. Did you have a question? Or you, no. Okay. And so he gives three characteristics that sensation has that imagination doesn't. So sensation is first of all for sensations, that is ideas that come through sensation. But again, so like when Locke says an idea comes through sensation, he means this external thing made me perceive it, right? It caused something in me. But Barclay can't mean that. There is no external thing. So what what do we mean when we say these ideas are sensations? They're not just my own imagination. So he says, number one, that sensations are not subject to my will. I, I mean, we've heard this before, uh, and um, and it's in Descartes too, and other places probably that. Um, um, one characteristic that marks sensations as different from mere imagination is that they come whether I want them to or not. Right? So, like, um, if the sun is there and I'm looking at it, I can't not see it. Um, whereas if I'm merely imagining the sun, I can decide to imagine something else. Um, so imagination or ideas in the of imagination, I don't know exactly what they call this, but I mean, so the truth is, but I think this is just going to confuse everyone if I say it again, but that Locke, I mean, Locke, Barclay calls these ideas that don't count as sensation, but merely as imagination, ideas in a more proper sense. <laughs> Right, that is the you know like he's saying when we talk about ideas and we when we when we want to make a contrast between ideas and things, this is the contrast for me. 
it's really a contrast between two different kinds of ideas. But so I don't know. Let me just call these like imagination. These are sensations and these are imaginations, right? So the imaginations are subject to my will. It's not that simple. Like sometimes you imagine something even though you don't want to. Um, but at least uh, anyway. You, but yeah, these are, I mean, they're at least to some extent subject to my will. Yeah. Um, what you're saying, Will, in this sense, is that like a lot of times, Will, or is this more like, well, like it's known as Will today? Oh, what, what do you think is known as Will today? Um, like <laughs> just essentially like having like a choice or freedom to choose or something. Like that. Well, that's what Locke meant by it, right? Locke said will is a power to do or not do something depending on what you prefer. Yeah. Um, well, so I mean, yes and no. Barclay is, on the one hand, I think Barclay would like agree with that definition of will, but he's going to add that will is. Uh, power of a spirit. It's therefore it's not an idea, and it doesn't resemble any idea. Whereas right, Locke thinks that there's a kind of idea called a volition. That's an act of the power of will. Or or well, maybe actually maybe he thinks that that's an operation. But anyway, there's a kind of idea that's an object of that operation. We have an idea of volition. Barclay is going to say we don't. Something we do, but we don't have an idea of it. But we'll we'll get back to that. But yeah, but as far as what the will, yeah, it means, you know, based on what I prefer, I can do something or not do it. Um, so like if I prefer not to see the sun, I can't not. But if I prefer not to imagine the sun, I can at least. I guess you could put it this way. It at least makes sense to try not to imagine. <laughs> and oftentimes you can succeed. But in this case, there's no such thing as trying not to see it. <laughs> You're seeing it, right? So like it, it's uh, not it's something that's in principle not subject to your will. Um, second of all, these are strong or lively. These are weaker. Right? So like seeing the sun is is in some sense, like kind of put your finger on what the sense is. It's not easy. And we'll, we'll see Hume struggling with this too. But in some sense, seeing the sun is much more intense than just imagining the sun. And the reason it's hard to, to put your finger on is because, of course, it's not like the real sun is brighter than the imaginary sun. I mean, you're imagining it being as bright as it is. <laughs> but somehow that brightness is not as, that same degree of brightness is affects you less when it's merely imaginary. Yeah. Can I like, um, maybe I just don't get ideas, kind of like my shoes, not seeing apples and apples, and like, wow, it's your red hair. It's idea of this is a complex of simple ideas now. Right. So, but I mean, at this point, we're talking about the, the simple ideas that make up the right because like we're trying to distinguish between that's that's why I wasn't sure what to put there, but like the sensations are like simple ideas that if your complex idea is made out of sensations, then it's an idea of a real thing. Right. Whereas if your complex idea is made up of imaginations or ideas in the proper sense, or that is these weaker ideas that are subject to my will, whatever, then it's an imaginary. Does that, you know, so like if you choose to see it as a red pair, you're choosing to see it as a real red pair. <laughs> um, 
or maybe it's just, well, what if like uh, when yeah. I said uh, getting the state of growth like from patient data recreation, like I haven't been to yet, but yet like imagine a case that was good. Yeah, so I mean that's a good question. I think uh, I don't know that Barkley thinks about that. I mean, if you want to think about that ad nauseum, you can read Husserl. <laughs> um, but yeah, how like. Uh, Perception always involves imagination and memory and whatever. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that I think that's true according to Barclay, but he doesn't really focus. On that. But you know, but like if you were to ask Husserl about that, he would, you know, he would say, well, the real thing has to be represented by sensations, right? Like, you know, so. Um, you could be imagining or otherwise representing aspects of it that, that aren't you aren't directly sensing, but it has to be based on sensation. So um, and you know, therefore, of course, you can be wrong about what you're seeing. Um, I, I don't I mean Barclay, like how could Barclay deny that? Of course, you can be wrong about what you're seeing. Again, I don't think he focuses on that. Thing. Yeah. I'm a little bit confused about how you can talk about real things versus imaginary things when saying it's all in the mind. And like, I was a little bit confused about how, like what you just said about how you can be wrong about seeing something, but if it's all in the mind, you can kind of just see whatever. Or how people, two people agree that those are the same thing if there's no external. Well, that, um, this, that second question is interesting and involves complications. But as far as the first question goes, it's like, so first of all, how we can distinguish between real things and imaginary things if it's all just ideas? That's what we're talking about, right? I mean, and he has to do that because he's claiming to represent common sense. And of course, common sense that chimera are not uh, on the same footing as Apple. They're not real, right? So he has to explain why we, why we say that, what we mean when we say that, and why it's an important distinction. But he has to explain it in such a way that nevertheless, what's on both sides is just ideas, right? And he's, this, this is the way he's explaining it, saying like some simple ideas are subject to my will and they're stronger. And there's one other characteristic I'm going to talk about and others are not, are Sorry, some are not subject to my will and they're stronger, and some are subject to my will and they're weaker, right? So, like, there is a distinction. It's a distinction between different kinds of ideas. Um, and when we say, like, apples are real, but chimera, you know, chimera, whatever the word is, um, are not real, we mean, like, we get sometimes get these kinds of ideas of apples, but we only get this kind of idea of it. And they're not, right? So they're not. Does that help answer that part of the question? Yeah. So he's not saying that the real ideas we get from sensations. Versus, he's just like starting from there and saying, no, look, they're actually just like, both ideas, but just different kinds of ideas. Yeah. But so this this is like then ends up being the definition of a sensation, right? Like a like sensations are the type of ideas that are not subject to my will and they're strong and etc. Right. So those that. So, and like Barclay says, like, I guess, I mean, you could put it this way. If you, Barclay could say, think about when you call something a sensation and you'll see that these are the ideas that you're calling sensation. Um, and as, as far as how you can be wrong about something, I mean, I was saying that because like, it, it's again, because you don't actually get all the ideas that, that are involved in your complex idea of a thing together. Right, you always get some of them, and you're like relying on those to be a sign of others. Um, so, but you could be disappointed. It can turn out the sign is not reliable. So, um, and and that does happen, you know. So sometimes, um, I mean, without going into weird things about holograms and mirrors and whatever, you know, like. You can see something far away and partially hidden and think it's an apple, but then when you get closer, you realize no, it's a red ball or 
right? So, um, you know, what does that mean? Like the, the sensations that you were thinking of as part of parts of an apple were really there and they were really sensations, but like the rule, how they were supposed to be connected to other sensations didn't work out. So when you got closer, you didn't see the other characteristics of the apple that you expected. Um, as far as how different people, so different people have different ideas, right? I mean, the ideas in my mind, like generally speaking in metaphysics, the, the rule is that, that substances don't share access. So, like these ideas are different than these ideas, but they can resemble each other. Um, and somehow that's the basis of our ability to communicate with each other in some complicated way. But I'm not going to say more about that tonight. Um, I think there were other questions. Yeah. Uh, just quickly, is strong and lively kind of, is it? Being used in the same way as like clear and distinct, or are they different? Which is all the kind of serious. Can you yeah, it's more like clear than distinct. Okay. The way Descartes defines clear, the way Locke defines clear. But I don't know if it's exactly the same. It's not in comparison to other ideas, really. Like it's not. Right. Distinct is about telling the difference between one thing and another. Clarity is supposed to be about like how is it or yeah, something like that. So I, I guess it is kind of like that. I, I don't know if it's supposed to be exactly the same as I call clear. Um, um, yeah, so I guess clarus in Latin actually means like shining or bright. So that's the original meaning. Um, so, uh, right. So these are two characteristics. And then the third one, which is these are regular. These are, well, these are less regular. <laughs> And um, somehow these two things seem to go together in Barclay's mind. Anyway, this is what he says in section 30, of part one, on page 35. Um, Um, not section three. Oh, okay. It's on page thirty four. The ideas of sense are more strong, lively, and distinct than those of the imagination. They have likewise a steadiness, order, and coherence, and are not excited at random, as those which are the effects of human wills often are, but in a regular train or series, right? So, like, the reason these are less regular is somehow connected to the fact that they're subject to my will, and my will is, um, a human will is, I guess, like, somewhat unsteady. <laughs> so, uh, so therefore, the, you know, um, um, like you can imagine an apple, you can imagine walking up to an apple and tasting it and it tastes like an apple, but you can also imagine walking up to an apple and tasting it and it tastes like a lemon, right? And like, sometimes you might do that. So maybe for no good reason, <laughs> right? So like, so like, because they're subject to my will, they're less regular. Um, the, the idea being, of course, that, sorry, use the word idea, but 
the thought being, of course, that these are subject to some stronger principle, some less unsteady principle that always works in the same way. Um, and that's why they're more like. And maybe that's also why they're more strong and lively. Well, the Barclay doesn't say that. So, and what is that principle? That principle is the divine will. Right? So, um, this is section 33, and this is on page 35. The ideas imprinted on the senses by the author of nature are called real things. And those excited in the imagination, being less regular, vivid, and constant, are more properly are termed ideas or images of things which they copy and represent. Right, so now, like, here's an updated picture. But, so there's like, uh, actually, let me just do this. There's like a human will here. And the human will causes this, this is this is my mind. And the human will causes certain ideas. The ideas it causes are so they're subject to my will. The ideas it causes are weak and and irregular. But then is divine will. And divine will causes ideas that are strong and regular. And these ideas that are caused by the divine will and are therefore um, not subject to my will, strong and regular, are what we call real things. So, um, and so, and these, these real things are, I think, like, it's important to understand this. They're not, like, somehow, like, ghostly because they're ideas. That's like that's the whole point of the distinction, basically. They're you know they're big and colorful and solid, and we eat and drink them and are clothed by them. Um, it's uh, it's just that all those characteristics, big, solid, colorful, whatever, are are things that are the immediate objects of our mental operation. And so they're in our mind and not somewhere else. Right? So, like as Barkley says, you know, again, trying to claim that this picture is actually common sense. He's saying, he says, you know, I'm it sounds a little weird because I'm calling them ideas, but just think of it this way. I'm saying that you're fed and clothed and whatever with the immediate objects of your senses. Isn't that what you really think? And isn't that what Locke is telling you not to think, right? Locke is telling you that when you eat an apple, you're not tasting the apple, you're tasting an idea. <laughs> Barclay says, that's ridiculous. That thing you're tasting is there. <laughs> and then if you say, but wait, it's like, it doesn't seem like a mere dream or imagination of an apple. Why is it different? Barclay would say, well, of course it's not because it's composed of ideas that are strong and regular and don't depend on your will. And why? Because God causes ideas in your mind. Um, Okay, are there more questions about that before I? Yeah. Find will somehow in us or like going into us in a way that would make it so you couldn't draw it as like an external 
circle that's shooting stuff into our body. Um, okay, so whether you can draw it this way is a good question because you shouldn't be able to draw it this way because Barclay thinks that because a, a drawing is composed of ideas and, and this these are spirits and ideas don't resemble spirits, right? So you can't draw a picture that's somehow resembles a relationship between spirits. <laughs> so there's something wrong about this picture. Uh, um, or rather, this picture doesn't signify the way we think it does. Um, so I'm going to talk about how, like, how we can so much as think or talk about spirits, according to Barclay. And I think you can apply that back to understanding how they could be in nature. So, I mean, so, but anyway, so having said that, I think you can see, so the question of like where the divine will is in this picture is really not such a good question. I mean, but, um, but what's true is that my will can, you know, um, can be conformed to it or not. <laughs> um, in various ways. And so, in that sense, it's definitely not me. I think that's all I'll say about it from Barclay's point of view. Right? I mean, we're not talking about Hegel here. <laughs> Hegel's one of the idealists that says, I'm not one of those bad Barclay and I'm <laughs> Right, you know, and his, his, you know, and he is going to say something like the divine will is both, you know, the the uh, infinite is both the finite and itself. So uh, the divine will is both the finite will and in itself. Right, you know, but Barclay is not saying that. I think. Is, is there anything else that you're? you're trying, did I understand the question right? I was just going to say, like, it seems like he's trying to say all of our ideas are. This seems like an external cause for our ideas. I don't know, like, yeah, the, oh, the relation to then the, all the stuff that he was arguing against. Or... Oh, oh, okay. So that all right. Now that's that's a different question. Like, in other words, doesn't he agree with Locke after all? He's just calling the external substance God. So I think that's true in a sense. But I'll I'll get back into talking about that. Like, what what it is they disagree about. But before that, I wanted to, to, this is a kind of digression, but it's an important digression um, because, so this is the question I want to ask. Um, so like, okay, so first of all, notice that um, if I stop perceiving something, right? So in Locke's picture, if I stop, if, if I'm perceiving a snowball and then I close my eyes or walk away or whatever and I'm not perceiving it, then the idea of the snowball, at least, I mean, I may remember it, but the idea of the snowball as object of sensation is gone. But of course, the snowball itself is still there. That's according to Locke. So, but according to Barclay, there is no snowball itself. <laughs> there were just those sensations. Now that I'm not having them anymore, there is no snowball. There's a remembered snowball, you know, there's a snowball that I expect later, but there's no snowball now. Um, so, um, and the question is, um, um, well, so, and there's one caveat to that, which Barclay adds, which is, but of course, if someone else is sensing the snowball, then the snowball is still there, but it's in their mind. So the question I want to ask is, you know, um, do things exist because
They're perceived by God. Right, so this seems like it could be, you know, then if you want to like get rid of the weird implication that snowballs come into and out of existence, depending on who's perceiving them, you can say, well, God is always perceiving. Them. Since God is always perceiving them, they always exist, even when no one, no finite mind is perceiving them. And, um, uh, and, uh, People have such a strong impression that Barclay's answer to this is yes, <laughs> that oftentimes this is the only thing people think they know about Barclay. They, they, right, that he thinks that, um, that what we call things are ideas in the mind of God. Um, so like he does raise that as a possibility. Um, so, for example, in section six on page 25, he says, um, Consequently, so long as they are not actually perceived by me or do not exist in my mind or that of any other created spirit, they must either have no existence at all. And here he's talking about like everything in the world, right? They must either have no existence at all or else subsist in the mind of some eternal spirit. Right, so that's definitely suggesting that the answer to this could be yes. Um, it, I hope it's clear, I'm building this up because I'm gonna say the answer is really no. <laughs> right, um, so um, in, he hints at this maybe even more strongly in, in section 48 on page 41. Uh, you know, I'm not going to read that, but and and even more explicitly in the dialogues. I think I mentioned this before. He's in 1713. Um, and it's a series of dialogues between one character called Hylas and the other is called. I don't know how you pronounce this, but phylonus or phylonus or phylonus. Anyway, like it means like matter and like lover of intellect or friend of spirit or something like that, right? So, so like, uh, so basically, like one of the characters is a materialist and the other one represents Barclay, right? And, they, and so, in the dialogue, at some point, the character who represents Barclay seems to, to state this even more explicitly that then like I don't think it's ever asserted as opposed to like raised as a possibility in this book. The dialogue is at least one place where the character representing party seems to assert it. Um, but I don't think Barclay could possibly mean this literally. Um, so, like, first of all, you can ask, what would be the purpose of God having those ideas? So, I mean, what's the purpose of our getting ideas from God? Well, I mean, so... First of all, they're a kind of sign of, of, of the divine will. In that sense, they're what I call before semantics, right? Like there's a language in which God speaks to us and a language of sensations. Um, and in the sense that those sensations signify something outside of that language, what they signify is the divine will. All of them just signify the same thing, the divine will, <laughs> right? But but because of that, because they signify the divine will, um, and the divine will is to make them regular, they also first feature as syntactic signs of each other, right? So like that is if if we if we um, completely understood the divine will. 
we would know what signs are coming next by, so to speak, the grammatical rules of this language. Just the way, you know, as I said before, chat GPT, like, has learned to know really well what word could come after what word. <laughs> okay, so that's the kind of thing that we try to, when, when, when we do what we usually call, like, finding out what's in the world or something like that. What we're doing is trying to learn the grammar of this language well enough to enable us to use one of these signs, one of these sensations as a sign that another one is coming. And of course, in particular, what we want to know is when pleasurable or, or, or painful sensations are seen. Um, so like, so, um, so the purpose of the divine ideas is, is for us to use them as that kind of sign. And the purpose of our ideas is to like um, um, follow out the rules that we think we know. Right? So like um, and I guess I mean this does have to do with your saying what you're saying about a mixture between sensation and imagination. I don't think Barclay thinks of it this way. That way. But right, so like I see the table. Um, and now um, on the basis of seeing the table, so like here's the sensation of the table. Based on the sensation of the table, I start imagining certain other sensations. So I imagine the sensation of walking towards the table and of doing this with my hand, and then I imagine, ow. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't hurt that much, but yeah. so I imagine that painful sensation. Now, like if I have managed in my like internal uh, rules and internal, I mean, this is all happening in my mind, right? Like I shouldn't really draw it off this line. It's all happening in my mind. But me, I don't know, I already raised this, but you know, that is if um, I can use my own will to cause somewhat weaker ideas that will follow in a certain sequence, that, you know, and if I learn the divine language correctly, then at the end of this sequence, I'll get the expectation of what it is that I'll really sense when those things happen. Right? So I'm trying to conform my will to the divine will in such a way that I learn to anticipate things based on the signs that God is giving me. By making the grammar of my language of imagination um, track the grammar of God's language of sensation. So that's why I need ideas in my mind. But of course, God doesn't need ideas to track his own will. Right? So what purpose would it have for when I turn around and I don't see the table, then the idea is that somehow somewhere in the divine line, in mind, there are still table ideas <laughs> that keep going. What does God need that for? Um, and Barclay says this, this is in section 74 on page 52. So, I mean, in this case, he's responding to someone who says, um, uh, well, okay, so I accept that we don't know anything directly about bodies or matter. But maybe um, there's something, we don't know what it is, because our ideas don't resemble it and whatever, but there's something that God uses as the, follows as the occasion on which he excites certain ideas in us. Right? So somehow there's some things that we don't know about that are going on down here, and God like consults them and based on their order decide, you know, like assigns ideas, causes ideas in us. Barclay says, like, 
this could, this this would be like the way um, when a musician has a musical score in front of them with notes printed on it. Um, they're using those notes to know what to play next. The person who's listening um, doesn't see those notes and might not even know that they exist. But Barclay says, um, um, on the part of an all-sufficient spirit. So, I mean, so first of all, Barclay says, well, Lord, what you're really thinking about is that there's some unknown ideas in God's mind that God is using to do this, right? So, like, there's no reason to think of these as the kind of substance that's inconceivable to us. They're not, it's not, you can't think of it as, a, as substances. You should think of it as ideas in the divine mind, right? So he says, what this hypothesis really amounts to is that God has certain unknown ideas in his mind that he consults and then based on them causes ideas in us. And, and he, then he says, on the part of an all-sufficient spirit, what can there be that should make us believe or even suspect he is directed by an inner occasion to excite ideas in our mind? Right, the divine will is enough. It doesn't need like notes to remind him what to do or something, right? So, so, so what I'm saying is, you know, Barclay is saying this about some supposed unknown ideas in the divine mind that we don't know what they are. But the same argument if, uh, applies even if we think that these ideas are the same as our ideas, right? Like, still, why does God need them? Um, and second of all, even if we accept that, who knows why God has these ideas in his mind all the time. So like when, when we all stop perceiving the table, the table doesn't disappear because God is still perceiving the table. Um, it's not clear what that gets us in terms of like this common sense idea that the world, the way we perceive it still exists even when we're not perceiving it. I mean, so like, for, so, so what we're, because like what we can say in this case is that God has ideas of the same type as our ideas. They're not an unknown type. So for example, they're color ideas. But um, they're not going to be the same as our color ideas. Um, and it's not even clear that there'll be a simple correspondence between them and our color ideas. So for example, when we turn off the light, we don't see the color of this table. Now it looks black. What color does it look to God? <laughs> You don't want to say it looks black to God too, because that would mean that the table actually changes color when you turn off the light. <laughs> um, but then that means that the color ideas that God has and the color ideas that we have are not really the same. Um, but it's worse than that because of an argument that Barclay makes about figure and extension. So um, so first, so like in context, this is in section four. Section 14 on page 28. Oh yeah. So he's responding to an argument for the distinction between secondary and primary qualities where the person says, the, his opponent says, well, secondary qualities are, are, we can know that they're just in the mind because like 
the same thing appears different colors from different positions, or the same water feels hot to one hand and cold to the other hand, or whatever. And Barclay says, now, why may we not as well argue that figure and extension are not patterns or resemblances of qualities existing in matter? Because to the same eye at different stations, or eyes of a different texture at the same station, they appear various. It cannot therefore be the images of anything settled and determinate without the mind. Right, so, um, so like the, the shape and size of the table um, are different in different minds because different minds are perceiving it from different points of view. Um, but also like eyes of different texture. So like the point here is that if you can see the table um, in more detail, it's going to look like a different shape. So even like two minds perceiving it from the same station, quote unquote, um, are still going to see different shapes if their perceptual abilities are different. Right, so to one mind, it's going to look like this, but to another mind, they can see more detail. They're going to see little bumps. And that's a completely different shape. Right, I mean, it's like different almost everywhere <laughs> from the other shape. Um, so uh, now we want to say, the table exists all the time because God is always perceiving. But what shape does it look to God? Like what station is God's eye at? And how much detail does God see? So we certainly don't want to say that God only sees like the vague outline of it. I mean, we see it better than God does, right? Like. I mean, aside from the fact that, that you don't want to say that about God for very few reasons, it also would mean that like these details that you see go away when you when you stop perceiving it. Now only God is perceiving it, so those details go away. And that's the kind of conclusion you were trying to get away from. But what if you say, um, and so that's going to prevent any stopping at any particular level of detail. So then you, maybe you want to say, well, God's quote unquote eyes are infinitely close to the table and see it in an infinite amount of detail. So um, Barclay thinks that doesn't make sense. <laughs> and this is part of his argument against the infinite divisibility of matter. Um, this is section 47 on page 41. Oh, yeah, page 41. So um, he's talking about um, what bodies would be like if they were infinitely divisible. And he's saying if they were infinitely divisible, then um, the closer you looked at them, the more parts you would see. In proportion, therefore, as the sense is rendered more acute, it perceives a greater number of parts than the object. That is, the object appears greater, and its figure varies. Those parts in its extremities, which were before unperceivable, appearing now to bound it in very different lines and angles from those perceived by an obtuser sense. Right. So, so far, this is exactly what I was talking about before. That um, when you can see it more acutely. You, first of all, it looks bigger because you see more parts. And second of all, the figure changes because now you see different, you see parts in the boundary that you couldn't see before. And then he says, um, each body therefore considered in itself 
is infinitely extended. Well, actually, I should start. Should start early. And at length, after various changes of size and shape, when the sense becomes infinitely acute, the body shall seem infinite. During all which there was no alteration in the body, but only in the sense. Each body, therefore, considered in itself is infinitely extended and consequently void of all shape or figure. Right? So he's saying is, and if this process can be extended ad infinitum, so, you, so like you can keep seeing the body more and more acutely. And every time you see it more acutely, it gets more parts and its shape changes. Then in the end, so to speak, when you finish all the infinite series, it will be infinitely large. And he's saying an infinitely large thing has no boundary and therefore it has no shape. Now, I mean, that last part, obviously, like it goes against some of the ways we think about infinity now, but whether who's right about that is maybe not as clear as my thing. But so, right, so, but, I mean, you can see why he's saying this. Something that has infinite many parts is infinitely large. You can't get to the end of it. So it has no end, so it has no shape. So if God saw the table infinitely clearly, it wouldn't have any shape at all. <laughs> so like the thing that we were trying to do to make our common sense idea of the table, like to, to, to back it up and say, well, the table is really still there because God is still seeing it. But it turns out that what God is seeing is nothing at all like what we're seeing. It has no shape. Who knows what color it is, <laughs> right? So, um, um, I mean, you could say, I guess, God sees all the possible shapes, right? But that again makes the world that quote unquote exists because God always perceives it totally different than the world that we normally live in, right? It doesn't contain things like tables. The table is something that has one shape and color and whatever, right? It's not something that has an infinite number of shapes. Um, so, um, so the, my conclusion from all of this is that uh, Barclay probably did not think, um, doesn't literally think that the world exists when we are not perceiving it because God perceives it all the time. Rather, I think that he agrees with, and this is getting back to, again, who asked this question? But, but so his agreement, that he basically agrees with Locke about what exists all the time. What exists all the time is not our ideas, but the powers to cause those ideas. Right, so when I'm not perceiving, the, when no one's perceiving the table, the ideas which are the table don't exist, and so the table doesn't exist. But the power to cause those ideas still exists. The power to cause those ideas is um, the divine will. <laughs> yeah. So just in that picture, the like experience, like there's like rules for the grammar of sensation and rules for the grammar of God's will that are kind of like susceptible of interacting in like particular ways. Well, yeah, but that's all going on up in this line, right? So those are syntactic signs of each other, right? They're like, that is, they're, um, I mean, I think you can understand better, better what a syntactic sign is, right? Like the, when I say, you could, I could say, the color and shape of the apple mean that it will taste a certain way. And what I mean by that is just that if things continue, continue in their regular pattern, like grammatically, so to speak, that color and shape will be followed by that taste. Or at least that's one like grammatically correct continuation of a sentence, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah, so um, if, the, uh, if, if these powers are always existing, and um, if he agrees with that, and I'm not sure why. Um, 
I'm not sure how that's uh, any different than like uh, physicality because um, like, if, if, like, if these powers exist and if they're not explainable via, you know, obviously the ideas they produce or any like perceptual, um, uh, per perceptual tools. I mean, like, like by his logic, that seems like that seems like like as much of a contradiction as um, physical as a, a, a physical. Well, okay, so there's 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 two parts to that. I, I, well, I might not get to, to both of them, uh, but um, but if I don't, I'll have to talk about it next time. But so, like on the one hand, you can say, so how is this any different from law, right? I mean, we're saying that that our uh, the ideas we call sensations are strong and, and vivid and regular because they're caused by another substance. Um, okay, call that substance God. Other than that, the picture is still the same. But um, there's a difference because Locke believes in that the ideas of primary qualities resemble something in the object. So at least sometimes that external object that is the cause of my sensations or sensation or reflection, <laughs> at least sometimes that external object resembles my some of my ideas. And you know, like remember what that means is there's a visible necessary connection between things. So um, um, so I'm not just gathering from experience what the grammar is. Rather, I can see it's somehow intrinsic to one of these ideas that it has to go with the other. And because of that, in those cases, I know something about the substance that's causing it. And what I know is that there's something in it resembling extension and motion and figure and so forth. And that's when I, I say it's an external substance, it's a body. And other times there uh, are other types of uh, simple ideas, the ones I get from reflection, um, don't have those visible necessary connections with each other. Um, so that's, so to speak, all ideas of secondary quality. And in that case, I say the object is a spirit. Right? And so the difference is Barclay doesn't believe in primary qualities. I mean, that is, he believes in the things that Locke calls primary qualities, like extension or whatever, but he doesn't believe in those visible necessary connections. That's absurd. Things don't point to something else. They're just what they are. <laughs> so, uh, so therefore, the object is always a spirit. So I think that's that's like half of what the question you were asking, I think, um, right? Like, do they really disagree about anything here is, is, is one half of it. The other half is, and I see, I know we're gonna be able to just re barely start on this. Although in a way I said a lot about it last time, but anyway, so like, how can we even, um, isn't it a contradiction to talk about something that's not an idea? But then, so the reason I talked about that last time is because I was talking about whether words, according to Barclay, whether their function is to signify ideas, right? And so according to Locke, when words are used correctly, that is at least except for particles, when words are used correctly, each word stands for an idea. Um, um, so according to Locke, if the word spirit doesn't stand for an idea, then the word spirit is meaningless. But Barthi, remember, says, no, there's other uses for words. For example, to um, 
cause a passion or incite someone to do something, right? And I think in general, you could say like other uses for words are like to directly express my will and try to achieve my ends. And in fact, when I, when I do use words to stand for ideas, so what happens when I use a word to stand for an idea is that I establish on my own an arbitrary new grammar, right? That's going to allow me to, to substitute a certain sign for a certain for a certain idea, um, with and then manipulate the signs using rules that I've determined, and then hopefully again, if I've done it correctly, I'll be able to cash out the signs into ideas again. Right. I mean, the signs are also ideas, but right. So in other words, I'll be able to to see the two apples go in the bag and see the one apple go into the bag, exchange each apple that I remember for a sign that looks like this, you know, and then like manipulate them and put them together. And like according to my rules, I'm allowed to exchange them for a sign that looks like this. And then according to further rules, I'm allowed to exchange that for three apples so i imagine three apples and i look in the bag of those three apples so the thing worked <laughs> right that's the way that's 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 the way words work and the point is that, like that's the way words work when they stand for ideas the sense in which they stand for ideas is that i'm allowed according to grammatical rules to substitute them for ideas but why do I want words to stand for ideas that way? It's always because of those other things, right? It's because like, um, I want to know if I have enough apples for something I want to do, right? So, so, so like a word like spirit or will or a picture like this, is just a word that achieves my will not by way of standing for ideas but directly. All right, that's all that's all actually more than I have time to say, but maybe I'll say a little bit more about it next time.